And uh, I want to thank Microsoft for hosting tonight and for Terry's uh, excellent presentation and for all of you people showing up end of summer. It's a busy time for everybody, I think. So uh, thanks for coming out tonight. And uh, as Drew said, my name is Brad Scott. I'm president of Ozone Technologies and we're about 13 blocks that way, uh, just down in Inglewood, a small boutique software shop. And uh, we're coming at the AI or the ML problem from a different direction. We're coming definitely from the, the microcontroller, microprocessor, application processor end of the spectrum. Um, we're agnostic about which cloud we work with. Uh, but as Drew mentioned, our, our end game is to allow people to take the, the models that they develop and the workloads that they develop and put them on the targets, put them on the embedded devices. Yep, I'll try. So uh, here's a handful of examples of projects we've done over the years uh, with Ozone. Uh, the types of products, uh, the, the markets that we've worked in. So everything from avionics, retail analytics, wearable devices, uh, industrial applications, uh, electric vehicle charging equipment, uh, smart city applications, auto, and this is a small handful of uh, examples. Some of these have uh, AI or ML capability in them. They don't all, but they all are considered to be IoT. So the space we work in is, is IoT and, uh, and ML. Uh, some, just a, an overview of the types of, of projects and what segments they go into and how much work we've done in these different spaces. Uh, so you can see uh, that it, it covers a broad range of IoT type applications. Uh, some of the clients we've worked with over the years and also uh, some of our partners. And DeepView uh, is our software tool and inference engine for the embedded ML platforms. And so these folks are partners with us, or we're partners with them, and uh, we, we deploy our, our solution on their hardware or so on. Uh, so one of the key things that I thought would be important to address for this community, given that I presume most people are used to working in the cloud or on a server or at least a desktop, is to answer the question why you might want to move that workload to the edge. And there's some technological drivers as the as the IoT devices uh, explode over the next several years, there's going to be numbers that, that the network can't actually support. So you cannot push video from all of these devices or other broadband data from all these devices to the cloud. There's going to be many, many examples where that just becomes an impossibility for cost or time or latency and so on. Uh, a stat that I found uh, a few months ago that I thought was interesting was that by 2019, IDC figures that 45% uh, of the compute will be done at the edge, and whether that edge is. Uh, so technological drivers, uh, a, lot of, a lot of devices and a lot of volume of data is going to make it challenging to uh, uh, compute everything in the cloud. Uh, and then there's also some specific use cases, and um, uh, they include uh, the bandwidth issue that I just mentioned, power consumption, doing it at the edge sometimes Im improves, lowers the power consumption overall. Uh, the cost of consuming that bandwidth, moving the data, and so on. Latency issues, if you want to do a real-time uh, loop at the edge, uh, you typically can't go back to the cloud to figure out uh, what's going on or if your vehicle is going to drive over a pedestrian or not. You want something a little faster than that. Reliability, redundancy, um, security, and uh, also privacy of data and sovereignty of data. So if you've got a, an old folks home or something like that and you're monitoring for fall detection, uh, you probably don't want to push all that, that video out onto the cloud. And if you can do it at the edge, uh, it's a much more compelling application. Uh, there's also commercial opportunities, uh, why uh, IoT is going to the edge. and, and these are examples or estimates of, of what's going to happen across the, the marketplace in terms of, uh, of growth. Potential economic value that's going to be generated by IoT devices, uh, McKinsey's estimating it's between 4 and $11 trillion by uh, 2025. And uh, my argument is that a portion of that gap or that difference between the low and the high is going to be how smart you can make those IoT devices. The smarter they are, the more economic value I think you're going to be able to produce for the users and, uh, and you'll be able to uh, approach that higher, higher value. Uh, some specific applications from our experience. Uh, these are more general ideas, really, right now. The next slide is about some specific things. 
So Industry 4.0 is really speaking to putting sensors in process control and manufacturing. And it could be at Pizza Hut monitoring um, pizzas. It doesn't necessarily need to be a formal manufacturing facility. Automotive, I think we read about that in the paper regularly. Robotics, drones. Uh, IoT is so broad, uh, I don't think we've really found out yet what the, what the range of devices is going to be. Uh, home surveillance, analytics, and VR, MR, all of these things have applications for artificial intelligence or machine learning, and they all benefit from being able to do that at the edge. Uh, so these are some specific computer vision and machine learning demos that we've uh, developed at Ozone. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some of these uh, in more detail uh, when I bring up the demos as well. Um, is there anything in particular I want to show here? Uh, I think they're all pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the ML suite, uh, our, our deep view ML suite, is comprised of several different components. Uh, first off, I'll talk about the, the pain points for the customer. So these are the problems that our customers see. Uh, first off, there's thousands of use cases where people want to uh, deploy machine learning at the edge. And so not all the technology that's available always meets their needs. Uh, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of processors that our customers have to choose from and have to try to figure out how to get the machine learning running on it. Um, countless data types and lots and lots of data sets out there in the world. And that includes different classes or different types of data sets as well. So uh, image data sets uh, include detection, classification, recognition, the kinds of things we were looking at earlier. Uh, video for actions and events and also time series data, which we uh, include voice, acoustics, vibration, monitoring these kinds of uh, seri time series data in that scenario. Um, for our customers, again, there's lots of frameworks that they're trying to figure out. Uh, TensorFlow, CAFE, MXNet, and others, uh, as well as the uh, conversion um, uh, tools that are out there today. NNEF is the one that we're working with right now and ONNX is another one that's uh, popular. Lastly, they gotta tie all that into a cloud service provider from somewhere. And, uh, and so for the IIoT space, uh, there's, there's several out there to choose from. And, and again, for the customers that we serve, helping them navigate that and helping connect that is, is what we do. Um, they, uh, obviously, there's a, a, a great growth in uh, literature around deep learning, which is something that they find when they're building a product, it's time consuming, it takes a lot of money, uh, it takes a lot of people, and it takes a lot of specialized skills, which are obvious, obviously very scarce right now. And so these are challenges for our customers. And the way we try to solve that or help them with that is with what we call the DeepView Embedded Machine Learning Suite. So it's really a set of, of components and software uh, that help people develop and deploy these products. There's a, a desktop toolkit that helps you design and, and um, profile your models. And to answer your question, there's some features in there that help you decide and optimize that model uh, for a given target, so you can see where your, what your memory consumption looks like. Um, <clears throat> there's application-specific development platforms, uh, inference engine and optimized models which we use to solve certain types or classes of problems for our customers as well as uh, some commercial ready solutions, and lastly, a framework to tie it into the cloud. And again, that's a, an agnostic uh, framework. So the, uh, the DeepView tool itself, uh, these are some screenshots from it on the right hand side. Um, it allows you to do your work in, right now in three different spaces. You can do your machine learning in TensorFlow if you like. You can do machine learning in CAFE, uh, and, and do your entire, all your research and all your development in those frameworks, or you can do it in the DeepU framework as well, um, and then deploy to target. So uh, through the, the framework, you can evaluate your model, you can evaluate it on the desktop, you can evaluate it on the target, and you can also uh, modify it and adjust it. So you can iterate on that design to make sure you're optimizing it for the problem you're trying to solve. The inference engine is designed to be portable, and there's essentially two variants of it. One that runs on Cortex-A or x86. For, for those of you that aren't familiar with the ARM, 
processors. Cortex A is their application uh, processor class uh, IP, and there's a whole series of them. Uh, there's a whole series of GPUs, and Minsky is one of their new neural net processing engines that they're uh, working on to deploy in the next probably 12 months. And uh, on, on that note, there's probably 20 startups at least, as well as some of the other majors that are uh, doing uh, IP development for essentially designing a new uh, CPU type. And everybody has a different name for it, but at the end of the day, it's a neural, neural net processing engine of some sort. And so uh, I think over the coming years, we'll see that uh, come online just like CPUs, microcontrollers, GPUs, and NPUs, or whatever they, whatever they end up calling them. Uh, and you guys probably all know that uh, uh, Google just uh, announced one as well for the Edge. So our inference engine lives on top of the, uh, of the ARM stack or on top of the x86 stack, uh, as well as on the Cortex-M, which is uh, ARM's lower end. Uh, microcontroller class um, MCU, and uh, on this slide, I'm showing that you can basically take uh, uh, that single inference engine, you can deploy whatever model you want to it, and you can go on a whole range of different hardware, from the low-end microcontrollers. Uh, there's a new uh, mid-range device that NXP is putting out. They call it a crossover because it's halfway between a micro and an application processor up into the gateway and potentially into the cloud if you want. Um, so the way that we're approaching the, the market and uh, trying, to, trying to reach uh, as many customers as possible is by enabling, um, <laughs> it's just jumping up and down here. Um, enabling uh, the semiconductor uh, manufacturers as well as the semiconductor IP manufacturers uh, to run machine learning on their platforms, uh, tying into a range of different clouds and offering a range of different services from consulting services at the bottom, tools and IP, which is really deep view, uh, commercial solutions, things like face recognition, pre-wrapped in a, in a solution, and then the cloud integrations that I spoke about. So the, again, going back to the, the root of the problem that we're trying to solve and what we get most often from our customers is how do they solve this n-dimensional optimization problem where they're trying to solve for uh, manufacturing cost, they're trying to solve it for development time and cost, they're trying to get inference time down to where it's appropriate for their particular domain, their problem, uh, model and memory requirements such that it'll run on a processor that meets their cost mark, and so on. So all of these things combined make it a kind of like whack-a-mole. It's hard to solve for all of these at once, and so that's, that's where the tool uh, really shines. And um, the things that I'm going to talk about today are basically model size requirements, inference accuracy, and uh, inference time, and, and how we zero in up on a problem like that. So... These are the general categories of uh, where you can optimize on, on a platform. Uh, a system design, if it's a camera, you might uh, go with a, a particular sensor. It could be in the infrared domain or color domain or monochromatic, depending on what, again, what kind of problem, what kind of information you're trying to solve for. Uh, network complexity, as, as you guys all know, is very broad. It's, it ranges significantly. Uh, compute techniques are how you actually do your, your matrix multiplies and your gems and stuff on the hardware. And then the processor architecture, there's a lot of different variants of architecture and, um, and they each introduce their own challenges and opportunities. So again, we're going to concentrate on a couple areas, uh, network complexity and uh, processor architecture. So here's a handful of common ImageNet models, um, and the, obviously the thing I wanted to point out is the input size has a significant uh, effect on the number of Macs, how much compute you need to do on, on the edge and how long it will take to, to do that. And here's a more sort of graphical form of that, um, of that slide. And so where we find ourselves working the most is on the left-hand side, really, on the smaller and mid-range um, networks and the ones that aren't in here right now that we're working on is mobile net so they'll end up 
uh, in this range here somewhere. And uh, of course, there's many different variants of that, so there'll be a, a few more bubbles on the, on the chart when we're done that work. Um, but that, that gives you a high-level overview of the type of models or type of uh, networks that we can deploy to hardware. And then on the embedded, on the embedded platforms themselves, um, we usually live in this region over here. We're, we're not uh, on the NVIDIA or mobile phone class processors typically. There's other solutions that are stronger there. And so we focus on the, on the lower cost uh, devices. And these price points are for um, essentially finished single board computers or SOMs. Uh, and the compute for those as well. So we'll get into a little more. Any questions? I'm kind of just zipping through these. Um, some more specifics on the classes of processors and, and how they map out in terms of uh, performance, what class of problem you can solve with each of them. So a K64 and a K82 are a couple of examples of uh, microcontrollers from NXP. And they're in the sub $10 range to go buy that processor and put it on your hardware. And the types of problems you can solve, um, TSR is traffic sign recognition. So we've got a demo here. Um, I didn't bring apples and oranges, but we've got a demo where we can classify different types of, uh, of uh, traffic signs on, on these low-end devices. Um, so you can classify these things on a K64 in a couple hundred milliseconds. And for lots of applications, that's, that's plenty fast. Um, and so the cost becomes more important in some applications than the inference time. Um, the next level up is this crossover I mentioned earlier. And it's, uh, it's an interesting part. It's, uh, it's still in that very inexpensive range, three bucks. And uh, right now we can do traffic sign recognition and we're hoping to be able to do face recognition on that shortly uh, on a $3 part that would find itself into microwave ovens, uh, white goods. It could find its way into door locks, uh, occupancy uh, detection problems, stuff like that. So at, at $3 in sort of moderate volume, um, that's a pretty compelling story for a lot of customers. And then up in the, yep, sorry. Nope, they're the ones that you and I can go buy from Avnet or Digi. I'm sorry, is there anybody over there still? Uh, so, so the question was whether or not there's any, <laughs> for the other people in the room, the question was whether or not there's any sort of special compute engine on those, on those chips, and there isn't. They're just standard. Uh, these ones are NXP parts, but uh, ST has them, uh, Renaissance has them. Yep, there's, we're, our end game is to use the resources that, that you have and you know, that everybody has and to enable machine learning on standard silicon. Sure. And standard will change over time as these new things get introduced, but standard today is, is literally those parts. So, um, you know, here's some examples. Uh, that's a K64, that's a $35 board that, you know, you probably have a couple on your desk. Right, so if you want to run these demos, you can run it on that board. Uh, a picture of a bunch of boards. So here's a range of boards that we typically do our evaluation on. And again, uh, these are specifically NXP, but there's uh, the, the common denominator throughout all of this is really uh, ARM cores and uh, Linux, Android, and either RTOS or bare metal on the, on the low end stuff. Uh, we've got a benchmark wall set up in the office where we do regression tests. So whenever we change the engine uh, or modify the models and so on, we can basically in an automated way benchmark across the whole lot of them. And uh, so in this instance, the traffic sign recognition example, um, across the bottom is a handful of boards that we ran it on. And up the left-hand side is how many milliseconds it takes to do inference on uh, on these signs. And so we've got a, obviously we've got an automated way to do all of that, um, but it uses our, our tools and our inference engine. Um, 
the next jump up is a squeeze net model and using ImageNet and a larger input size. And so on these devices, we're up into the application processor domain. Uh, these are all Linux, Linux platforms up to uh, sort of edge compute, uh, um, fog compute class uh, layerscape parts also from NXP. So this, this one has, uh, I think, eight A72s at 1.8 uh, gig, rather. And uh, I think their next one has 16 cores in it. So if you're, if you're deploying to a network edge, other than to a device edge, um, this, these solutions all work there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of next step on the ladder for us is to get mobile nets on these classes of devices. And uh, it'll probably be the lower end of the mobile nets, and it probably won't work on all devices. But what that will give us is uh, a quick way for us to help customers deploy, uh, especially vision problems, to uh, these low-cost devices. So some specific uh, examples. Um, this is uh, traffic sign recognition on a Cortex-M. Uh, the way we do validation is from file rather than from a, a camera. And this is a screen grab from the tool, from the DeepView tool. And it shows you what your memory consumption is um, by layer, as well as how many uh, Macs are used in each layer. So when you're going in and modifying a neural net to try to optimize it for a piece of hardware, uh, this will give you the data that you need to do that. And it'll do it on the desktop as well as on the target. And that's what I hope to show you in a few minutes with all this other stuff on the table. Uh, same kind of example here on a different class of part. Uh, this Cortex-M7 device has a camera interface built into it. And so uh, that's the one we're showing here. And w what happens is you hold the sign in front of the camera, and it gives you inference and shows you the answer over here. And this is uh, how many milliseconds it took to do inference. And so it's just continually running inference on whatever it sees in that region of interest and giving you an answer. Uh, this particular uh, example, this fully convolutional network, um, was accurate on that data set 96%. So in the wild with a camera, it goes down a bit, but that's the kind of accuracy we typically see. Uh, a few more numbers on uh, across the board on a bunch of different processors. Uh, just to give you a comparison, uh, traffic sign recognition is something that we use often as a benchmark because it, we can run it on everything easily. And so we can get figures from the high-end devices that are you know, $50 devices all the way down to the $5 devices, $3 devices. And so you see a range of uh, 100 milli or one millisecond on this end up to 200 milliseconds on the, on the slower, less expensive device for that class of uh, model. Uh, jump up in performance. Uh, going to a Cortex-A72. Uh, and so this is another data set that's available publicly. It's a distracted driver. So um, we, we built a, a model or a, a neural net to solve that problem. The, we get accuracy in the order of 66%. It takes about a day to train that model on a desktop. Um, and it runs on this platform, uh, which we have here. And, uh, and again, when you're going in and refining the model and trying to figure out which layers are consuming the most resources, either compute or time or memory, um, that, that chart gives you that information. So you can iterate on your model and, uh, and find out how to improve the, uh, the solution for the device you're targeting. Still an ammeter. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, maybe you can play around with which memory you're using a little bit, depending on the device. But frequency is probably the biggest one. Sure. And then uh, depending on, it's, it's a system design problem. If you don't need to do inference all the time, sure. can you do it once every hour, once every minute? What makes sense? Uh, another example is face recognition. So this is running on an A53, um, and uh, we're doing face recognition on the edge, as well as we're able to train the SVM model on the edge. So if you want to add new faces to the uh, to the platform, you can. And 
that's something I don't think I can, I can demo after the talk, uh, but I can't demo it online like the other things. So the implementation overview of the face rec uh, is really uh, at the front end, we're, we've got a feature extractor. It's pre-trained offline and um, uh, it doesn't say it here, but that's, we're currently using Inception uh, V3 to do that. And then an SVM that's trained dynamically offline, uh, or sorry, online on the device when you add new faces to, to get the uh, classification. And so in this case, oh, there it is, V1. Um, the input size is 160 by 160. It's about half a second to do uh, inference on the uh, extractor. And then overall, the end-to-end -end runtime to, to find out if you, if you uh, know who's standing in front of the camera is about one second uh, by the time you do all the other, other things. Well, it's a, it's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but one of the things we're working on right now is to figure out how to sort of scientifically determine how accurate we are. Um, because it'll work for you and I. It'll probably work for everybody in this room. But that's not statistically significant when it's the lock on your door, on your front door, right? Like you want to make sure the wrong guy's not getting in or the, the old Pierre Trudeau is not getting in. Um, so... Uh, I, I don't know what the numbers look like, and I don't know how it would behave in that case. Uh, it behaves well if somebody wears a hat or takes their glasses on or off or with a beard or without a beard. Um, makeup, we haven't had a chance to really test because we don't have enough women in the office. <laughs> Maybe we need to put makeup on ourselves, I don't know. Um, so we just don't have a big enough sample size to really be able to answer that question. There might be some other, the way we've implemented it is similar to the way it's been implemented in, in other work. So there may actually be some papers on it as well where they've explored that, that would be directly relevant to our implementation. So on to the demos. Oop, back up, no conclusions yet. How are we doing for time? I forgot to set my watch. You're going to be able to see it in a minute because I'm just going to show the tool. Oh, okay. yep. yep, so we should be good. Well, it depends how well it works, <laughs> <laughs> like most demos. Um, so in this example, this is, again, the traffic sign recognition example. This is the data set, and this is the data set curator of the tool. Uh, so this would be an entry point into the tool flow, or you could use uh, TensorFlow or CAFE, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to do all your work in, in those training frameworks and then use the tool to deploy to silicon. So in this example, <coughs> there's about uh, 39,000 training samples, 12,600 test samples across uh, about 43 uh, different uh, classes. And you can go in and you can examine your your uh, your data and and look for you know things that are misclassified or examples like this you might take out of your test data set because it's pretty hard to tell what it is um, you can go in and modify this is the this is the representation of the graph for the the neural net that we we're using right now which we call FCN and as I mentioned before um, you can uh, parameter you can profile that on target so when I when I push this button it runs inference on my machine a few times and gives us the parameters for uh, the relative parameters for each of the layers in that network as well as uh, the specific memory usage and so on 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 this target and so on the desktop you can iterate and refine your your neural net to uh, to optimize for whatever it is you're, you're trying to shoot for uh, there's a training window, which we'll skip over because everybody's done that and it takes a long time. Uh, and then there's also a validation uh, window, which helps you go in and, again, find uh, mis misclassified uh, objects or images. So you can go in and um, 
basically go in and look at all the different things that are in there and figure out, try to figure out why they're being misclassified. So in some of these examples, I can understand why it got it wrong. I would too. Uh, the point of this is also though that you can go and connect to one of you, your devices. So I've got uh, three devices networked over here. And so I can test that exact same model running on um, the K64, for example, that, that lower end part that I was mentioning earlier, and validate it. And what happens is, right now it'll push a model down to the target, and then it starts pushing data to the target, doing classification on that, and pushing that data back, that classification data back up to the, to the host. So in this example, you can see um, what the accuracy is right, how long it's taking. So it's taking a couple hundred milliseconds for most samples. And uh, I've tried it. I can't beat it by looking at them. <laughs> I can't count that fast. But um, there's lots of applications, again, where a couple hundred milliseconds is more important than, say, you know, spending another $50 on the silicon. So um, that's an example of uh, GTSRB or traffic sign recognition running on um, a low end part. And then conveniently, I have another version of that same model uh, or a slightly uh, more optimized version of that model and so when I go in and validate that on the target um, you'll see that it runs a lot faster it goes through the same process pushes this updated model down or tries to and and then validates. Well, that's not going to work. So, all you were going to see there was validation happening faster. Same, same, same process. Um, I'm going to load one other model here for you, um, if I can find it. So this is distracted driving. Uh, this is a more complex problem, of course, than traffic sign. Um, and hopefully this one will work. So uh, in this example, there's uh, uh, how many? Was that 30,000 uh, or 25,000 uh, samples and 10 different classes from SAFE plus nine other forms of distraction? which I think I've probably done many times. Um, and again, you can uh, go in and, and view this uh, in the graph designer uh, and the network validator, and you can also validate it on target. So this time I've got to select a more capable platform, and uh, we'll see if this one validates. So this is a more complex network. Um, a more complex problem and a more capable processor. Uh, so using the tool, the customer can basically define or refine their, their design for their problem. And as I mentioned earlier in the slides, there's a whole broad range of uh, categories of problems that our customers are trying to solve. And so we've tried to encapsulate the, all of those capabilities within the tool so that they can address that range of problem. Um, another capability here that I forgot to mention on the previous one is it shows you the real time uh, uh, power consumption or time consumption for each layer as well so you can see what's happening on the device and all of that's running on the device so anything that's being reported back is um, uh, the, the times yep Uh, it can change a lot. So in this example, this this uh, distracted driving example, um, I can't run it on it right now, but this part has a GPU in it as well. And so if you choose to run the application or the inference on the GPU instead of the CPU, so you're going from an A50, A72 to a, it's a, called a GC7000, which is a, a Verisilicon or Vivante GPU, you probably get a 4x improvement. 
Um, does that answer your question? Yep. Well, some trial and error. I mean, we've done it. We've worked with it enough. We'll we'll be able to describe, you know, where what range you should be working looking at, whether or not you're likely to solve it in a microcontroller, or you're going to need an application processor, or you you don't have a hope. You got to you know do it in the cloud, and so you can get within a range, and then any one of these families of devices comes with a whole different range of clock speeds and memory footprints and so on. And so as you refine your design and um, figure out what uh, accuracy is acceptable or what the you know premium accuracy can be, then you can make decisions about which device you might want to run on and start looking at the system costs and, and everything else along with that. And so there's, there is, without a doubt, some iteration but with the tool, that iteration can take, as you saw, you know, minutes, especially when it runs. It happens faster. Any other questions on that? So is that in TensorFlow? That is not in TensorFlow. We did the training in TensorFlow, right. and we used TensorFlow under the hood in the... Um, the training uh, workspace of this particular tool. So this, this workspace here has TensorFlow behind it. Okay. And so we basically put a graphical wrapper in front of it so that for our customers who are maybe not machine learning experts or not computer vision experts, uh, they, they can use, you know, get the benefit of TensorFlow without having to know all the oh, details of it. But do we use the model we did for that, for that with Verizon? Yes. And we're running it on our inference engine, which allows us to run it on microcontrollers, GPUs, as well as Cortex A X86 devices. We pull the weights out. We, so we we take TensorFlow, for example, a protobuf, and we bring it into our work, workspace using the NNEF exchange format. Okay. And from there forward, it's it's using our uh, engine and. Yep. So, demos, conclusions. Um, in our world, ML can be applied to uh, solve all kinds of different problems uh, at the edge, including images, video, uh, acoustics, voice, and uh, vibration for machine monitoring and so on. And the cloud won't always fit into your embedded device. And there's lots of reasons why you might, want, might not want to try to cram it in there, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, with, uh, with appropriate network design and uh, processor selection, you can solve many commercially interesting problems. You can't solve all the problems, but there's, there's a, a broad section of commercially interesting problems that can be solved at the edge. And uh, <coughs> using the tool, uh, basically optimizes that uh, iteration process and helps you get onto the to silicon more quickly. So lastly, uh, contact information, and uh, if anybody's interested, we are also hiring. So if this space is of interest to you, you've got machine learning uh, expertise and some curiosity about uh, embedded, uh, give us a ring, and you can find us at embeddedml, embeddedmachinelearning.com. And can I answer any questions? Okay, I'll take my take my toys over there. Okay.